Welcome to Stack Hunters. I'm Bradley Stalder at Djibouti Puns on the X Machine. Here with me tonight, John Lobb at Grid Iron Skull 91 on the X Machine as well. John is the Grid Iron Scholar, college fantasy football, NFL fantasy football content creator, FSWA, FSWA man. Well, also me too. Like it's, it's we're just part of the club, you know, fantasy sports writers of America. Uh, <laughs> rookie big board aficionado, of course, history teacher by trade, John Lobb. Welcome to Stack Hunters. Well, thanks for having me on, Bradley. It's great to be part of the player profiler team this year. And this is the first time we've got a chat on, um, you know, the across the world, I guess, right? Anyone can yes. watch this on the on the YouTube, on the YouTube television. So it's great to be here. Um, you have given me a great list of questions and this or that and decisions to make. So I can't wait for it. You know, I've looked at over 90 rookies now. I'm knee deep in it. We have 36. No, wait a second. 41 player previews up on player profiler that I wrote. I have another six or seven. I'm doing a sleepers column that's going to come out. So, you know, you'll have about 45 to 48 players previewed. Of course, everything else that player profiler gets you. This is just my scouting reports, how I look at players. The rookie guide's coming out, I think, next week sometime. So we are ready, man. But you... You have a great little um, slant on the rookies here, which I think we can make some people some um, wise decisions coming up. I love it. All of that and more right after this. All right, John. It's been fire on the X machine as of late. People have been going back and forth. The shots have been fired. The anger and the vitriol, the back and forth. <laughs> and it's been inflamed by LSU's Pro Day, where Malik <laughs> Neighbors ran a 4 3 5 unofficial. You know, in some places, 4 3 9, 4 3 0, whatever. 4 3 5. I don't care. It's been inflamed. Malik Neighbors, he's being drafted 34th overall on the underdog best ball streets. But the question is, is he the wide receiver one? Because he is not the wide receiver one in terms of a rookie wide receiver ADP. That goes to Marvin Harrison Jr., who's going middle of the second round. 17th overall, only 16 players drafted ahead of Marvin Harrison Jr. currently in the underdog streets. John Lobb. Talk to us about Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. Well, first question is, which wide receiver is more landing spot dependent? I'm going to say it's going to be Marvin Harrison. And the reason why I say that is because he is more, to me, in my film study, in my projection moving forward, he's a classic X receiver. And what I mean by that is he's on the boundary He's going to line up on the line of scrimmage. Now, I don't have too much concern that he's going to beat the defensive back. But when you are out on the boundary, you really have to have a quarterback that believes in you. And, and there's going to be a lot of times where a great X receiver is one-on-one. -on -one. Julio Jones, A.J. Green, um, La, uh, um, oh, DeAndre, um, DeAndre Adams. And you have to have a quarterback who's going to let you make a play. And there's a lot of quarterbacks who don't do it. Let's just take for an example. He ends up with Derek Carr. Now he's not going to end up in New Orleans, so don't freak out, everyone. But if he had Derek Carr, do any of us believe that Derek Carr would have the chutzpah to throw it up when Marvin Harrison is covered one-on-one? -on -one? Sometimes... I mean, we saw what happened with Chris Olave, right? Yes. And it's not been great. It's not been no. great, John. no. And, and one thing I'll say about Matt Ryan, when he was in his prime with Julio Jones, Matt Ryan had the chutzpah, I'm throwing it to Julio. It really doesn't matter because even when he's covered, he's not covered. So I think Marvin Harrison is going to be more dependent. And then the other, there's two parts to this answer. I believe Malik Neighbors is more versatile. Mm. 
and you can put them on the inside. You can put them on the outside. You could probably line them up at H back. You can put them in the backfield if you want. Why is that important to me? You can scheme Malik neighbors open a little easier. You can find the mismatch by putting him in motion by trying to get the zone man coverage to get him in that mismatch. And that will allow a quarterback like Derek Carr. Oh my God, look at Malik neighbors. He's got three, three foot of separation and I can throw the ball, right? I think Marvin Harrison, he's not, you don't have to scheme Marvin to be open. Marvin will be open one-on-one on the boundary, but you got to have the guy who throws him the ball. Then I will say this. When you're playing outside on the boundary, you have to have a quarterback who throws it out there and isn't afraid because you can't get picked off for the pick six. So there are plays to be made that I think some quarterbacks will shy away from. So I'm going to say Marvin Harrison is more scheme dependent than Malik Neighbors. Yeah, Malik Neighbors, for those at home, only played 207 wide snaps last year per PFF, 241 in the slot. So much more in the slot last year for LSU. And then looking at instead at Marvin Harrison, you know, he, you mentioned he is a boundary. He is an outside wide receiver. He can win big. And so that differential between Harrison jr. And neighbors, I agree with you is going to be very interesting neighbors. Number one last year in PFF receiving grade Harrison eight, but beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, These are guys who crushing it. You know, it's funny because we can all argue about PFF. I think we all look at it. It's interesting. I use yes. it as a barometer. Sure. It doesn't mean I have to agree with everything, but I will say something. When my anecdotal subjective film analysis in October, December is going on, and when I thought Malik Neighbors was the best receiver in the league, and then I pop in the PFF grades in like December 15th, I'm like, Oh, someone else agrees. Like, I know it's confirmation bias, but, you know, you don't want Malik Neighbors down there at number 38, right? Like, nope. okay, at least someone someone else saw what I saw yes. all the time. And we can disagree with grading, and that's part of the fun of what we do. Yes. But at least I had hoped he was in the top four. He was number one. And that's what I saw when I watched the film. Well, does the Malik Neighbors 34 overall end of round three make sense? Is he going to make that immediate impact year one with both playing on the outside and the slot? What are your thoughts on that, John? I'll say this, and I'm I'm the biggest Malik Neighbors fan. I have to say, I think that's a little rich. There's got to be veteran wide receivers who've proven themselves. Like, may I ask, I'd even look at the ADP, I should have. Is Michael Pittman in that area? Are there, uh, like, what are the veteran receivers coming off the board? Sure. Malik can, Neighbors. Give me some names there. Yeah, Malik Neighbors is at uh, wide receiver 23 off the board. At okay. 30, now 33. So since I even refreshed it, he's moved up. What up one? Uh, there are three wide. These are the three wide receivers ahead of him right now. Tank Dell, Michael Pittman, Jalen Waddell. These are the three wide receivers behind him in ADP. DK Metcalf, Devonta Smith, and Cooper Cup. So I would take Smith, Waddell, and um, the first who, oh, Michael Pittman. I would take all those over Malik Neighbors. I would probably take Malik Neighbors over Tank Dell. I yes, just am concerned same. if Tank Dell, he has to show me he can play 17 games. I had concerns about his size. There's no question the talent. There's yes. no question when he's healthy, but can he play 17 games? Um, I, I love Devonta Smith. Um, the other ones, uh, who were the other two that you mentioned? DK, me? Cooper Cup. Okay. DK and Cooper Cup, yeah. Cooper Cup concerns me with this ceiling yes. because you do have Puka Nakua there. You have Kyren Williams there. I think he's past his alpha male 160, 170 targets. So I, I would probably take Malik Neighbors there. And there's no question over DK Metcalf. While I think DK Metcalf is a better NFL wide receiver, I think his ceiling is limited. Now, we do have a coaching change, but the quarterbacks limit DK Metcalf. I think we've kind of seen now 
his ceiling is what, maybe 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns? I mean, he could always pop, but I don't think 1,400 yards and 13 touchdowns is likely. So I would take neighbors over DK right now. But if you're conservative, I could see why someone wants the 1,000 yards, eight touchdowns from DK. All right. We'll keep going down the list. Roma Dunze is the next wide receiver being drafted. And he is, he was 10th in PFF receiving grade last year. So certainly an absolute baller. Washington going to the national championship. 6'3", 215. Some have him, some evaluators, John. And maybe you're in that tier, maybe not. We'll find out. Big reveal. Some have him in the same tier as Mar- Malik Neighbors, Marvin Harrison Jr. Would you agree with that sentiment? I do not currently have him in the same bucket. Dang, it's close. I mean, I, I, I want to put him in that bucket. I just can't. I do have it. My three, it's, it's Malik, it's Marvin, then it's Roman. Now, I just think there's a little bit difference. I don't think, I mean, it's hard for me to say this because I can't believe you're nitpicking here. I just don't think he's as beautiful of a route runner. He He's better at the catch point, but I don't think he is as good of a route runner as Malik. And I don't think he's just as naturally gifted as Marvin Harrison Jr. I mean, it's really close. If you told me three years from now that all three of these players had three consecutive thousand yard seasons with the ceiling of 11 touchdowns. I would be like, yeah, that's the outcome for the three of them. I mean, I have no question about that. Um, I do think landing spot will differentiate the three. You know, we can talk about that later on, but I do think Romo Dunze is super close. My friend, I love him. I'm not surprised now if he's going to go in the top six picks of the draft. The train is leaving the station from a lot of big people. I mean, I did not expect the train to be moving this fast. We're still a month out, right? We're about a month out from the draft yes. now. And the oh, Dunze, there's a Dunze conductors. There's people who have them at number one. And you know the Jets are looking at it. The Falcons are looking at it. Like, I think teams, the Bears at nine. Yes. I think they're a little scared now. Because I think about a month ago, they thought Roma Dunze would be there at number nine, no questions asked. I think there's only about a 30% chance he makes it to number nine now. So I do think the tra- it's rolling down the track. Yes. He might end up in a better position with a better quarterback. That's interesting. But, man, he his outrange, his, he could be an amazing player. He does have the physical size and the hands and the body control of an alpha male but again he's an x boundary receiver in my book like you put him on the x let's go son like he is that type of player yeah odunze only a hundred snaps pass snaps in the slot this year so not completely not a hundred percent on the boundary but about 80 percent on the boundary and so you project he's going to get top 10 draft capital. It seems like that is trending that way. PFF has him as the sixth overall player in their yeah, I think big he's board. Moving the, I'm telling, I think it might be, this might sound crazy. It might be three quarterbacks and three receivers in the first six picks, which is uh. interesting because if you want offensive linemen or defensive players, values just flying down the board for yep. you. I mean, the offensive linemen, there's going to be some teams getting really good off. Joe Alt is going to be on some. Uh, yes. <laughs> but so, I think it's trending yeah. that way. So he's going to get this top trend 10 draft capital. That's what we're we're expecting right now. He's being drafted. It was 51 overall. Now it's 49. So the end of the fourth round, beginning of the fifth round, seems to be about the spot where Odunze is going. If he gets confirmed with that top 10 draft capital, do you think he'll continue to rise? Or do you think that this is already baked into the player profile and our expectations and landing spot and all of that? Do you think 49 is about where he's going to taper off to? Or do you think he he can get into that Malik neighbors end of the third round, fourth round, if he lands in the right spot? If he goes in the top six, with the right spot, my friend, he's going to go off the board by pick 40. He's going to go like 37 to 40. There's no question about it. 
the, what's going to happen over the summer? I mean, we've lived through enough summers of the hype, and I love it. I mean, I've been in this industry. I we're love here it. for this, John. We're, we're here, here for this, this, right? You're going to have hundreds of fantasy experts talking about three these three young men yes. as all potential thousand yard receivers, and they're going to point to like Jordan Addison, Tank Dell. Last year, who and they're just going to say, look, if if Addison and Dell could do this, these are three better prospects than Addison and Dell. Yes. So they're who going can do to, of course. Yes. Yeah, they're going to <laughs> jettison the, the, the rankings up. And then you're going to have the dynasty community is going to fuel this, which will then spill over to the redraft community. Right? Yes. Like, it will, I almost, ha- I will almost predict that Matthew Berry in the month of July will come out and say Roma Dunze is my guy in the class or something. And then you're looking at that 35, 36 pick. Whew. So what is the range of outcomes for Roma Dunze in year one? Because this is a best ball podcast. So we're drafting just for 2024. What is his range about? Does it exist for Roma Dunze to outscore both Malik Neighbors and Marvin Harrison Jr. in year one. Is that something that is within the range of outcomes? Oh, without question. I mean, I I would say he's got a 15, 20% chance of doing that. I think his range of outcomes could be 1,100 yards and 10 touchdowns. That's I mean, to project that for a first-year wide receiver, that's a pretty hefty projection. But I go back to what we saw with Jordan Addison and Tank Dell and Puka Nakua, right? But let's, I, I don't, because no one had Puka that type of prospect. He wasn't in this breath of prospect. No, he was not. So it's not fair. I don't want to bring his name into this conversation. We could even argue that Tank Dell wasn't this level of prospect. No. Really, the two were, were Jackson Smith and Jigba and Jordan Addison, right? Yes. And one of them kind of landed in that bad spot. That really hurts us. And that's another story, another question. But if if Jordan Addison could do what he did, and then you look at these, I have all three of these young men, I have graded higher than Addison. Granted, Addison landed in the ideal spot for his skill set. Playing with Justin Jefferson, playing with TJ Hawkinson. I know they got hurt at times. But it was high volume offense, John. It was Kirk Cousins dialing it up. Yes, and and that was just the perfect landing spot. But these three men are better than J- J- Jordan Addison. All right, we'll continue with the next tier of wide receivers. We don't see another wide receiver go off the board for Roman Dunze until Adonai Mitchell at 102, and then there starts a little tier of the next group of rookie wide receivers. It's Adonai Mitchell, it's Xavier Worthy, Troy Franklin, Lad McConkie, and Keon Coleman – over the course of the next two rounds. So from pick 102 to about pick 126. Um, Are there, is there a top two for you there? And is there an avoid of those players, those five wide receivers? This is my favorite question on the sheet, Bradley. I just have to tell you that this is where the value is. Mm. This is best ball drafts five years ago when you could dip into the rookie class at this time and get Justin Jefferson or Devonta Smith. This is what we're talking about. It, mm. to me, is a no-brainer, and I, I will draft both of these heavily, Xavier Worthy and Troy Franklin. And here's why. We are best ball. Yes. What am I looking for, Bradley? I'm you looking want big for spike weeks, spike, baby. Spike weeks, baby. I don't care if Xavier Worthy goes three for 25. I really could care two craps about it. What I want is five games with over 75 yards, four touchdowns, or four or five receptions, and one or two touchdowns. I want that 22-point mm. spike week out of Xavier Worthy. He will have that if he's in the right landing spot. He's very – he has similar Jordan Addison. Remember Jordan Addison had those big game pops where he had like oh, two yes. touchdowns, 100 He was yards, the wide receiver right? one in one week. Yes, That's what we want, and that's what Worthy should give us in the right landing spot. The other one, I I seem to be one of the last on the train. So many have jumped off. 
but I'm on. I'm baby. I'm on. And if we if we go off the bridge, then I'm going with them. It is Troy Franklin, dude. He is going to have spike weeks. I have him graded one. Let me make sure I got this 100% right. I should have my old memory. Yep. I have Troy Franklin at number five prospects and Xavier Worthy at number six. That's okay. how much confidence I have in Troy Franklin. I don't care about the gauntlet. I can't overlook two years of film study. I can't overlook the production model in my numbers. I read about him being sick. Was it Lance Zerline, one of those guys reported, or, or yeah. Tony Pauline? He was sick at the combine. He gained back the weight. He is the ultimate home run hitter. Mm. I'm telling you, man, when, when, when a play breaks down, if I'm his offensive coordinator, if he sees the quarterback move out of the pocket, Troy, just go deep. Break off your route. Go deep. I don't care where you are. I don't care where the quarterback is. I don't care nothing. You see that quarterback break the pocket. It is fire alarm, fire drill for you. You go deep. Like, just do it. Because there's not very many defensive backs who can stay with them for 10 yards. And let the quarterback just fling the ball. I love that spike week. I think he's going to score like three touchdowns over 50 yards. I mean, Troy Franklin's going to be a very frustrating player. But I don't care in under in underdog best ball. He is literally going to go. You can watch a whole half, and he might not have a target, Bradley. Like you'd be like, what is with Franklin? Why? You know how fans are all mad that you know they're playing DFS. They put him in their lineup, right? And all of a sudden he's going to go three for 70 with the touchdown in the second half. I mean, it's just he's going to be a little scheme dependent and opponent dependent. I'll say this: if you have weak safeties against Troy Franklin. He's going to kill you. Now, if you have the all pro safeties, if you're like the 49ers or maybe the Ravens, right? You have really good safeties back there. He, you know, he, they can slow him. But if you have bad safeties who are jumping the quarterback or they're staring into the backfield, Troy Franklin's going to kill you, dude. He's going to kill you. I'll say this to answer your other question. You couldn't pay me to put Keon Coleman on my team. Ooh. I'm obviously using hyperbole to exaggerate. Yes. But if I got Keon Coleman in the 20th round, okay. At this price, there's no way. We don't get kick returns. We don't get punt returns. And Keon Coleman, here's going to be what's interesting. With the kickoff rules, my friend. Yes. Keon Coleman is raising up draft boards right now. And people are going to be fooled into this. There's going to be a team who takes Keon Coleman to kick and punt return. And you know he's going to kick and punt return. And people yep. are going to be fooled by the draft capital. And he's going to be a better special teams player as a rookie than he is a wide receiver. I am I have questions about Keon Coleman. I'm very low on him. Let me see what I have him in my rankings. Pre-draft, I have Coleman at number eight. So not awful, but I have my questions about him. But teams are going to draft him on special teams. That's what they're going to do because he can punt and kick return. And with the new rules, you need that. So Keon Coleman's going to go way up. I like Lab McConkey. He's a safe play. Lab McConkey is going to be very five receptions, 50 yards, and you're hoping for the touchdown. That's nice. But you know what? I'm not winning a best ball tournament, you know, with, with 750 yards, 60, 60 receptions, and seven touchdowns. Not winning a best ball on that. Not at this ADP. Not, not at, at this ADP. ADP. No way. Yeah, I mean, if he was round 19, okay. But no, not where is this round? What is what are we talking about? Round eleven? And We're talking about like round eight to round oh, ten. No way. I want I want home run hitters. That's it. Home run hitters. You want them in a chain. You don't want you don't want the the grinder in this round. No. No, right? you don't. You don't want safe floor plays at this spot. No, no, no. Not no. at this spot. No. No. Well, we are going to continue on. There's a couple, um, you know, the next tier is the Roman Wilson, Xavier Leggett, Ricky Pearsall, Jalen Polk, Malachi Corley, Devontae Walker. Picks 153 to 192. Give me one target and one avoid in that range. I love this player, Ricky Pearsall at 166, dude. I think I moved him in my top 12. I should have this on a different screen. I have him at number 11 right now. I have a second round grade. I think Ricky Pearsall is going to go in the second round. 
I do profile him as more of a slot receiver than an outside receiver, but I do think you can put him at the Z. And he's a big slot receiver. And that's what I like about him. We have now learned at the NFL, with a good coordinator, you can put a big athlete. Like, I grew up in an era where the slot receiver was always the small guy. Right. Now you have teams who are saying, look it, we can create an off a- automatic mismatch with the 6'1", 6'2", 200-pound slot receiver because we're looking usually at a cornerback or safety covering him. So I think Pearsall projects very well in there. I do think he's the type of guy, you know, he's going to be interested. He's going to be like three games of two touchdowns and then only score one other touchdown the rest of the year. Because I think when they have like an inherent mismatch, when, when, when the offensive coordinator finds they just don't have a nickel back who can cover Ricky and they're just going to scheme red zone passes to Ricky, I think he's going to be perfect for best ball because you're going to get these massive spike weeks. And you'll have a nice floor of like, you know, four catches, 45 yards. Ah, Maybe he gets his way into your flex, right? If you have a lot of bye weeks or you have an injury here or there. The guy I'm avoiding, people might not believe this. I'm not going to have any Malachi Corley. I don't believe it. I'll tell you why. There's one. It is a massive, massive, beyond big red flag. His PFF ADOT was 5.5 my benchmark is 12 yikes he is not bad he is borderline disaster i dare you to find anyone in college with an a dot who's become an nfl receiver under seven he reminds me too much of rondell moore and i had no Mm. more i don't have him in one league and i said the same thing and this was before A dot was easy to get. I said, this is all I know. Every time I watch Rondell Moore, he's catching the ball two yards behind the scrimmage, or and his A dot was like 3.4. Like it was so bad. And that's literally what he's become in the NFL. Like he is a gadget slot player, and that's Malachi Corley and Bradley. His he was playing, trying to be nice, conference USA opponents. There wasn't an NFL defensive back or safety who could tackle him. All that, all that awesomeness that he does, that ain't happening in the NFL, folks. There's linebackers who will tackle him in the open field. Like you literally have coverage backers who cover him. It's not so I'm off of Malachi Corley. Whew. Yeah, he was uh pulling it up. You mentioned 5.5 is the Average de- or the average depth of target that's tied for 496th in college football. Like, I'm that's glad that you, you know, it's disastrous. I didn't know there were 496 <laughs> wide receivers in college football. So, <laughs> I'm not telling you, he's in the Rondell Moore bucket. The only thing that's different is he's a little bigger, so he's bigger than Rondell Moore. But Rondell Moore at least played at the Big Ten at Purdue. I mean, I bet you most of our viewers right now could not name Western Kentucky who their opponents were last season, let alone a defensive back who can tackle in the open field. Yeah, no, I I don't think I don't think so. They did play Ohio State. They did play Ohio State. There you go. And he was okay in that, but that I mean he was okay. Garbage time. I mean, but that's you know when you're a, when you're a lower level G5 team playing a power five like Ohio State, you get the third and fourth quarter pepper targets to your yes. stars because Ohio State's just burying you and they're yes. on their third defensive unit, right? So go, okay. ahead, go ahead, Malachi, catch the passes. Sure, we'll get it. We'll get it to you. Before we go yes. on to running backs, John's been absolutely crushing it, bringing the fire here. Before we go into running backs uh, in the best ball streets, it's also dynasty season, John, and we need to hear about the Dynasty Deluxe brought to you by Player Profiler. This episode is brought to you by Player Profiler, the Dynasty Deluxe Package. 
The rankings are the best in the industry. It includes strategy mode where you can say, hey, change the rankings to be win now. Oh, change the rankings to be productive struggle. There's also a draft planner to help to strategize where you should take players because the draft planner also includes ADP. There's a trade finder where we look up on my fantasy league and we see trades that are done, including a particular player. Then there's a trade analyzer where you can plug in draft picks, players, and we assign a lifetime value to draft picks out five years. The best thing about our trade analyzer, it can't be gamed with volume. And there's mock draft data to see right now what's the market for player X versus player Y, including in the fall when very few mock drafts are happening. And our dynasty guide, the dynasty dominator would cost you 10 bucks on Amazon, but you get it for free with dynasty deluxe and you get our rookie guide for free, a $25 value. So you get all of that for 45 bucks. I mean, it's a great deal. That's right. It is a great deal in the dynasty streets. Check out the dynasty deluxe package on player profiler we're going to continue on with john law make sure you're following him on the x machine at gridiron skull 91 john we have a clear rb1 off the board but he doesn't come off the board until pick 110 that's trey benson do you agree that trey benson is the running back one for this class and if so what are the ranges of outcome for Trey Benson now that he's, uh, you know, projected to get at least day two draft capital. One, I don't have him at number one. I have him at number four. And I understand why people are tantalized by his size and speed. Six foot, 216, and he ran a 439. So I understand that. And their coaches, I, I mean, I'm old. They always say you can't coach size and speed, and there is some truth to that. But you can't, I don't, I, my film study, man, I have some serious questions, Bradley. I don't think he could find an open door if you had a light bulb shining on it. I mean, his vision, Bradley, I don't know, man. I saw him run up the, the backside of a guard a whole hell of a lot. And I'll say this, I FSU was undefeated, everyone. They might have made the playoffs if they didn't have their quarterback go down. I think it was the third to last week of the season. That was Jordan Travis. And they finished undefeated. Let me tell you, I watched at least nine games of FSU. Now, I know the eyeball test is subjective, and I get that. But, Bradley, I never watched one game and ever said Troy Benson's the best player on the team. Not one. Not one. Mm -mm. And – When you watch great backs, especially at college, you knew Jonathan Taylor was special. You Mm -hmm. knew Todd Gurley was special. You knew Brees Hall was special. I never once, and I wanted to like, here's the irony. In Debbie Leagues, Bradley, I had Trey Benson in my top three over the summer. Like, I wanted to like him. And all I ever said, man, this guy. I don't get it. So you plug in the numbers in the model. I, I, I'm I'm trying to be open-minded, right? So my film study says no. My model says, yeah, but. Yeah, but. His BMI isn't over 30. He only hits 28.4. Again, not the end of the world, but we do know that number 30 for BMI is kind of magical. He's tall. And he's only 260. I mean, he holds his weight well, but at the end of the day, we care about BMI. Yes. Two, his scrimmage yards, he only dominated 21%. Bradley, when was the last time you saw an undefeated team with a back that had less than 21% of the scrimmage yards? That's that's a weird conundrum. They weren't winning because of Trey Benson. Exactly. It isn't that bizarre. And then the stat that really kind of shook me, PFF runs of over 10 yards. He only had 23. So for all that speed, he didn't, just to give you an example, Jalen Wright, 35 runs over 10 yards. Another example, Bucky Irvin, 31 runs over 10 yards. Audrey Kisteme, who people think is an elephant running, 38 yards runs over 10 yards. Let's go, Estime. Baby. <laughs> People don't even want Cody Schrader. 
He had 36 runs over 10 yards. So how do I how do I justify a 439 with no home runs? Lack of vision. Yeah. I mean, Bradley, that's what I saw on film. If he doesn't do have a lane that an elephant could walk through, he ain't walking through it, brother. So we're taking away from John to avoid Trey Benson at 110 as the running back one off the board. That is our takeaway here. And our next tier, we've got a next tier of about three running backs in the ADP streets, Jonathan Brooks, Blake Corum, Jalen Wright. We know the story about Jonathan Brooks, like he, the ACL tear. He's obviously rehabbing. He looked pretty dynamic uh, at times on the field. But um, of those three, Brooks, Corum, Wright, buy, sell, or hold? How would you characterize these three? I love this question. I'm going to buy Blake Corum. Mm. He's the most NFL ready to get on the field, I believe, from day one. He is so good at so many things. He's a really good, efficient NFL back. He might end up a better NFL back than fantasy back. And what I mean by that is I could see him with 1,500 total yards. You know, he gets 1,000 rushing, maybe four or 500 receiving. Ah, I wouldn't even so let's say 1,000 rushing, and then he gets 300 receiving. But he scores 12 touchdowns. I know there are people who will argue that touchdowns are not a skill. It's an inch. I do believe I've seen enough football from Marcus Allen and two. Like Dre Benson can't run goal line, dude. No, because you you've got to be you got to find the thinnest of holes. Blake Corm's really good at goal line. He's really good in traffic. He's going to have thirty or thirty five receptions. I he's not Najee Harris. He's not going to run 10, 15 yards down the field. He's more of a screen dump off, but you're going to use him a little bit in the passing game. He's NFL ready. He's older. Isn't he 24 right now? I think he's 24 if my old man memory serves me. He's 23.3 right now. Okay. So he's going to, you're going to use him in two or three year window. You're not saving him. You're no. not saving J- Blake Corum, especially in this NFL environment where running backs no. are churned through. Just run him into the ground. Who cares? Rookie rookie contract, run him into the ground, let him go. Like, I'm not trying to be mean. I just, that's what they're going to do, I think. What if he ends up in Dallas? What if he ends up in in Los Angeles, uh, right? I mean, Pants are, off, John. Pants off. That's what's going to yes, happen. Those are prime day one running backs who I can plug in and he won't hurt me. Yes. I would say Blake Corum is he's much better than Devin Singletary trying to think what would be so floor of Devin Singletary, which is okay. Um, and I'm trying to Joe Mixon ceiling. If he got in that high, like Dallas type of offense, right? He, he will make, he could get 14 touchdowns in a Dallas offense. Like that would be nasty because they have so with, with Ferguson and, and CD lamb and yes. Dak Prescott, he'd be nasty there. So I love Blake Corm. That's who I'm going for there. Now, the the hold is tough because we're in underball best ball. I have to hold Jalen Wright. I cannot mm. take Jonathan Brooks with the injury. Yes. It looks positive right now. It looks good that he should be back. But Bradley, we have the complete opposite of Corm. He's 20, Jonathan Brooks, right? Right. He's got... Six six years ahead of him if he's healthy. It's in the range of outcomes that a team drafts Jonathan Brooks and just sits him on the pup. Why are you going to risk this young man if you like mm. him that much? Put him in the second half of the season. Let him get healthy. Let him be sure. around the NFL yes, team. Sure. And I don't know if an underdog, he's the he's at pick 120. That's round 10. Yep, the end what of round 10. Get on, what if he doesn't get on the field until week nine? 10 and that's, that's not gonna work brain. yeah i mean it's hard to take a zero for six seven weeks and then you have a buy what if he ends up on a team with a week nine or ten buy oh well are you are you really going to play him for one week before the buy i mean that's not gonna they're gonna they're gonna you know, give him a couple carries at the end of the game and just get his feet yeah. for the 
that's not going to move the needle. So uh, this so, is great. This is great. I would We're, take Jalen. I would take Jalen Wright because, and there's some questions about Jalen Wright and I, that sure. Tennessee offense, that wide open offense. But Bradley, he's a home run hitter. I told you he before, is. he ended up with 35 runs of over 10 yards, man. Mm. He averaged over seven yards a carry last year. He's 210 pounds. His BMI is better than Trey Benson. His BMI is 29.3. I like the film and I get it. I don't think he's got the most wiggle. I, I admit that. He, like, Coram's got amazing feet in traffic. Yes. Like, his wiggle. I mean, Coram was the RB1 in terms of PFF, a, a rushing grade pre-ACL tear. Yes. He's great in that right there. I, I mean, Jalen Wright's not in that no. bucket of skills. But he is explosive. Like, I, and I don't, I don't want to say, I don't think he's Devin a chain. But he's got similar possibility of outcomes. Mm. Love it. I love it. Well, we will finish up the running backs here. Let's uh, let's get one guy that you are targeting and avoiding. I'll pick 150 or beyond. So we got Marshawn Lloyd there. We got Braylon Allen. We got Bucky Irving, Ray Davis, Audric Estime, who's fallen precipitously post combine. <laughs> Shipley out of uh, yeah, he fell. He fell like a like a sinker in a pond. You know, you put it on. <laughs> Put it on your uh, on your fishing Woo! rod, and he just sunk. Uh, Dylan Labe, Frank Gore, give me one target and one avoid, and then we'll call it for running backs. So there's no confusion. I'm not related to Dylan Lobby, so don't, don't worry about that, everyone. There's no relationship there. Just kidding. That's a bad joke. Sorry. Old man joke. Dad joke, as my daughters would say. So <laughs> that, that I hit like a thud down there, so I got to move on. So the player that I, this might be – so I'm, I I got to give you two I like because the the the, the discrepancy. Sure. Sure, sure. I love Marshawn Lloyd at one fifty four, and I love Will Shipley at two hundred six. And here's why: it. Will Shipley's the no one's talking about him. No one is talking about him. He had eighty five receptions in three seasons. Yeah. He was an immediate breakout at Clemson. I believe he had a thousand yards his first year on the team. Last year he had limited carries. He split the he missed some games and he split the backfield on the second half of the season with Phil Maffa. Who guys, Debbie Asset, that's a, just a tip. Phil Maffa's good. Will Shipley had 28 runs of over 10 yards on very limited touches last year. He ran a 439, folks. He has he's 5'11, 200. His BMI is 29.4. He's an NFL back. He's not an NFL workhorse back. He's an NFL rotational back who I believe has more explosiveness than Devin Singletary. He's in so the is Devin he like a Kenneth Gainwell type? Is that yes. better okay. though? Better. Let's put it this way. Kenneth Gainwell and Devin Singletary. If Devin Singletary was a little faster and Gainwell was a little bigger, that's what they're both missing, size and speed. Mm. I love it. Shipley has that. And I'm telling you right now, he might get 50 receptions as a rookie, my friend. He might only have 75 carries, but he might have 75, he might have 50 receptions. He is going to be a pass catching back in the NFL. He's very good in that regard. And what I like about him, he might be your pass catcher, but in the red zone, you could put him in on first down because he could run it in for you. So, like, he's going to be a very interesting player. And he's at 206. Come on, Bradley. We're looking for ceiling at 206. He's a he's a 20-year-old back with, with major P5 experience. I get the film isn't always pretty, but there's also some really good tape on it. Like, there's there's he's got a wide range of outcomes. And in best ball, I'll take the risk of what 206? Is yeah. he 206 there? You're getting a Whoa, six. That's that's <laughs> incredible, dude. That's Beautiful. incredible. And then I would avoid right now at this. I I would avoid Frank Gore Jr. I don't see it at the NFL level. I think it's name only. Hey, he might prove me wrong. I liked him at Southern Mississippi. I have him now at 22 in my rankings. He's just a little under. Well, he's all right. 201, 5'8". I just don't see it at the NFL level. 
I know people are going to the name, and I get it, I get it, but I'm not taking Frank Gore. The 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 level from G5 to the NFL is too great, my friend. Just too great. Just too great. Well, we're going to keep moving on to quarterback. Caleb Williams projected to be and expected to be the first quarterback off the board in the NFL draft at the end of April. That is not a surprise. But what might be a surprise is that he's being drafted as the quarterback one among rookies in best ball at 110. And I want to give you two ADP comps for him at this spot, John. Tua, Tungavailoa, and Trevor Lawrence. Are you buying or selling Caleb Williams at 110 overall, given those ADP comps? I will. Let me say, let me preface it first. I'm buying Trevor Lawrence over Caleb. I'm not taking Tua over Caleb. So I, if that helps our viewers, I yes. love Caleb Williams at 110. Absolutely love him. And here's what I love. We know the prospect. We can talk about that later. The Chicago Bears, I will give them credit. And I'm no fan of that organization. I think they made lots of mistakes over the years. Yes. But they seem to have learned from their mistake with Justin Fields. You yes. cannot put a rookie naked on the field with no help. What they're doing right now, with DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, they have um, the tight end. DeAndre Cole Swift. Komet, the DeAndre Swift, Cole Komet. He's got exceptional playmakers. Do they have the ninth or the eighth pick in the first round? Got I the think ninth the, pick. Okay. You're going to get – here's they're, they're in such a good boat, Bradley. They're mm. either going to get Rome, which I don't, do not think that's maybe. possible now. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe but then they're going to get the offensive tackle. Yes. Like if I need one thing around Caleb, I need now their offensive line improved last year. It was much better last year than the year before. Now but imagine they, having Joe Alt. Oh my God, dude, that would do. That is what they need. But I, I can't imagine the Titans passing on Joe Alt, but that would be, come on, man. You put Joe Alt on that Bears offensive line, and I think he's a. I, I I might take him at four overall. I mean, that's how much I. I mean, I love Joe Alt. I think the guy's amazing. I take. I, I'm a big believer in the tackle. Give me the god darn tackle. So the Bears can't lose here. No. What they're doing is they're going to land, and I, I think this is similar to what Detroit did with Jared Goff. They built the team around golf and they added the final two pieces in Gibbs and Laporta. But yes. they had Amon Ross St. Brown. They had two all pros on the offensive line. They had talent in the backfield. They bring golf in. All of a sudden, golf's a very professional NFL quarterback. There's nothing wrong with golf. But golf is playing around superstars. Watch Sine, um, Sine Puel, people. He's unbelievable. Hall He's famer. unbelievable. When I. In the fantasy season, I get overwhelmed with the statistics. So you're watching the playmakers. In the playoffs, dude, I steered at Sene Pool. Pool. I watch them all the time, dude. He's unbelievable. And Ragnall, the other guy, oh, that line, man, he's a dog. So, it, unbelievable. That's what Caleb Williams is being dropped into. And now here's what I love about him that I don't think is given enough credit for. You know what his yards per attempt were in his career? This is outstanding. 10.3. 10.3. Drake May, 8.4. Jaden Daniels, and we've said Jaden Daniels throws a deep ball. He's 8.9. JJ McCarthy, 8.7. Bo Nick, 7.9. We've all heard the stories about that. 10.3. Just to give you an idea, when I look at the best quarterbacks in the last 11 years in my model, Deshaun Watson, 8.7. Trevor Lawrence, 8.9. Tua Tagovailoa. Now, he had the greatest pair of wide receivers, 10.9. Kyler Murray, 10.4. Lincoln Riley. The only two guys better than Caleb Williams at that 10-3 are Tua and Kyler. That's their floor as a fantasy player. 16% rushing equity in his best season running the football. He's not Lamar. He's not um, uh, Jalen Hurts. He's Justin Herbert. And I'll take the 400 yards 
Trevor Lawrence, Justin Herbert, good. He should have yeah. 400 to 500 yards early in his career. I love it. And with the football, Bradley, 39 touchdowns to 14 interceptions playing as a true freshman. Thir- Let me repeat that. 39, I mean, 93 touchdowns, sorry. 93 touchdowns, 14 interceptions, and he took over for Spencer Rattler as a true freshman, and the kid did not turn the ball over. He did All not. day long, baby. He is he is awesome at that value right now. Yeah, we're really excited about getting the Bears and just the amount of weapons. And <coughs> I was big on DJ Moore before the Keenan Allen, and I am a little lower on him now that Keenan Allen is there, but not too much lower. The explosive plays are going to be down the field for DJ Moore. I still like him as a one-two oh, yeah. turn pick. Like the big plays, we saw that last year with Justin Fields. And if you have increased passing volume with higher average depth of target and the big playability from DJ Moore, I love DJ Moore at that one two turn. Even can I even ask with you a little... question? Sure. Bradley, can you look up Cole Komet? What's his ADP? Yeah, Cole Komet is uh do 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 Tight end 15, 132 overall, end of round 13. I'll tell you this right or now. end of round 11, end of round 11. Let's say I go heavy wide receiver, real heavy, first five picks. Then I jump into two running backs or something in the next five picks. And I want Caleb as my second quarterback, which, or maybe even your first, which depends is, on how you I've been him. able to get Caleb at like the 120s, 130s. That, and then I would draft Cole Komet, dude. Mm. I love the double yeah. tap. On the top, and it's costing you nothing. And my friends, do you know Cole Komet finished top ten in in tight ends last year? I bet you most people each of the last two years, each of the last two years, Don. I mean, (laughs) and we all have Caleb Williams higher graded than Justin Fields as a passer. Yes. I mean, why would you not get Cole Komet? And he is the uber best ball, right? He gets the 28 mm. point and the three points, but I don't care. I mean, you don't have to. He's a 15th rounder. What did he, he probably had three games over 20 points last year, right? For your second. He's Spike Week King. You yeah, love I it. I loved it. So I would love the Caleb Williams, and it costs you almost nothing. Like that's love just. It. I'll it's take a beautiful it. price. Yeah. Well, beautiful. My- <laughs> we'll finish up with uh the quarterbacks questions uh the order is caleb williams jane daniels drake may jj mccarthy one two three four in adp is that the right order and are there any of those other three daniels may mccarthy that are more landing spot dependent than the others So I'm going to answer your second question in a kind of backwards way. Let's just, whoever goes to New England, I'm out. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, if you, whoever lands in New England, forget about it. I'll say, but here's the thing. Like, I want to say Jaden Daniels could overcome New England because of his legs. But Bradley, he was throwing to two first round picks who are in the NFL. How is he yes. going to feel with Ken- Kendrick Bourne and Juju Smith-Schuster slogging on the eight-yard out and they're heavily covered? I mean... We're going to get kidding. 120 targets for Ramondre Stevenson. That's what we're here for. I mean, oh my, he might have 200 yards. He might have 200 carries, but he might die. I mean, that that's like, it's such a conundrum because they look at... They're doing the they're doing the Chicago Bear New York Jet thing. We're just going to draft the quarterback and put no one around him, have no offense and no help, and let's see if the kid can survive. That is a failed strategy over and over and over again. Bradley, you might think I'm crazy. I would draft Marvin Harrison if I'm New England. I would wait a year or two to get my quarterback. Yes, because they need to build that roster and or then trade down. It. Or trade down. It's like stu- It's stupid to bring in a quarterback. They're just, yeah. that's not doing it right. Well, and the Patriots already doing- came out and said Jacoby Brissett could be our starter this year. And I actually believe him, John. I do too. You need everything. Literally everything. 
Like, why not get Bo Nix or Michael Penix in round two? Like, and, and play and, and and play Jacoby Brissett. Just throw the year. You're not winning anything, dude. Your roster is atrocious. So, I, but they're probably going to take the quarterback, which isn't, or they got to trade down. That's yes, they, trading got down. To, I think is they, yeah. They've got. There's no way if they're intelligent, they think that they are a quarterback away from being competitive in the NFL. That's just a terrible strategy. So, let's take New England out of it. I have I have Daniels at my number three, but he is the number two fantasy prospect in underball or uh, underdog because he has that two touchdown hundred rushing upside. Right, that is yes. don't let the Patriots draft Marvin Harrison. Everyone's afraid of that. Everyone, everyone. So if you have Jaden Daniels, he has too many spike week upside. Yes. Like there, he has, I would say his floor. If he plays, let's say he plays 15 games. Let's because he had he does take sure. some hits, and I think he needs to get better. 15 games. He should have 750 yards rushing. He should have eight touchdowns. So if you're telling me I have a best ball quarterback with 750 yards rushing and eight touchdowns, then anything he does throwing the ball, what are we looking at? Maybe 2,800 yards passing and 15, 16 touchdowns. I mean, it's still, I bet you lands you in the top 10, top 12. So I think you have to put him there for that way. Then I'm going to put Drake May. Now, I personally think May and J.J. McCarthy both need time to grow, but they're not yeah. going to get that from the tea leaves no. I'm reading. I want whoever, I'll say this, whoever lands in Minnesota – I'm probably going to be all in as a second quarterback. There's just with with the coach, with the improved off their offensive line graded much higher last year than it did when um O'Connell first took over the offense and the team. You have Justin Jefferson, you have Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson should come back at one point. Aaron I Jones mean, is there, he's a spike yeah. week king. And I think they're going to draft another running back. I think, that, look, if this is a draft, they can go in the fifth round and get a running back. So I, yeah. I'm not worried about that. Ty I Chandler whoever, and Cam Akers, we'll see. Yes. So I would have then, I would have Drake May over JJ. I do think JJ is a project, but it, man, everything's telling me he's going to have, they're going to force him to play too early. He's 20, he's 20 years old. He's only got 29 starts. He really needs the Patrick Mahomes, yeah. the Jordan Love. He really needs I, – I mean, just so the young man can be a better professional, he would do so well sitting behind someone that he can grow. Like, let's say Minshew. He's not going to make it to the Raiders. No. But if he could sit behind Garden Minshew for a year – that would be a good thing for JJ, but that's not going to happen. I don't think. No, it won't. And that's the thing is these NFL teams feel the pressure to put these yes. quarterbacks out there right away because they know that their job is on the line. If they're not winning, yes, it doesn't matter, you know? And so they they might just lose with the rookie anyways, but nevertheless, it's uh, <laughs> Jane Daniels is the quarterback too, for fantasy. I love it. I have 14% um, exposure to Daniels right now in my way too early best ball drafts. This is great. That's, I mean, you have to go for the upside, right? He's probably going to get 30 fantasy yep. points at least once, if not twice. All right, John, we've got two quick questions about tight ends because uh, there are only four tight ends that are getting drafted in underdog <laughs> fantasy. This is wild in terms of rookies. Uh, real quick, we're, we're almost time's up. Uh, are you buying or selling Brock Bowers as tight end nine, 81 overall. And is there even a landing spot that makes sense for that ADP? Um, I do like him at that ADP. Okay. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I thought when, when I looked at the spreadsheet before I rolled down, I'm like, I bet you he's going off like in the top 50. 81's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, I, I mean, oh, I'm trying to think Denver would be a really nice spot for him with yep. Sean Payton who had, um, oh, who's the great, um, tight end that he had in Seattle, Jimmy, Jimmy Graham. Graham. I think he'd be very interested in Denver. That would be absolutely perfect. I'll tell you this. I'm looking at some of the things. I'm bypassing Jatavian Sanders. Okay. I'm lower on him than most. I'm taking Ben Sinat, dude. Grab him. I have him as my number two tight end. Let's go. If 
If you haven't seen this, folks, 6'4", 250, he hits my benchmarks at size. It's 22% aerial dominator for a tight end, folks. That's amazing. He ran a 4'6", in the 20-yard shuttle, a 4'2", in three on drill, a 6'8", He's an uber athlete, uber with 82 career receptions. For over 1,100 yards, he's a really, really good player. Now, he played at Kansas. I have him at number two. I'll tell you this right now. I would love him as my third tight end at number 238. Oh, my God. 238. Last round pick. Last round pick, John. Love him. Love him at that price. All right. This has been an absolute treat. Chatting about rookies with John Law. Make sure you guys are following him on the X Machine at Gridiron Skull 91. John, any last drops before we call it for the night? No, I just want to absolutely thank you. It's been awesome tonight. I'm so excited to be with you. Everyone who's known me, I'm a huge UConn fan. I don't even know the score yet, but I'll watch the second half. But you're more important and the player profiler team than watching UConn Huskies. Now, (laughs) fairness, I would never, when someone asked me on the show and Bradley asked me, what, about two months ago, I promised this date, and when I promised something, I never, ever failed to live through with it. So thank you, Bradley. I had a Thank you, John. And if you want to see all my written stuff, go to Player Profiler. It's all there. Check it out, everyone. All right. On behalf of John, I'm Bradley. Until next time, good luck in the best ball streets, everybody. From the podfather to you, I deeply appreciate you tuning in. And many ask, what can I do? What can I do to help support the host, the research they do, the production costs? Go to playerprofiler.com, Dynasty Deluxe, World Famous Draft Kit, Rankings, DFS Dominator, and of course, Data Analysis. Subscribe to any one of those, and you support all of us, and take Player Profiler to the moon.